some people starting to filter in. We're just gonna give you a second or two as people enter the room. And then we will get started. In the meantime, I just wanna welcome everybody near and far. We love Baltimoreans, we love our international visitors. Drop a note in the chat where you're uh, tuning in from if you'd like. Hi everybody. We're gonna give it like, uh, 20 more seconds and then we're gonna get started. Hello, we've got someone tuning in from Amman, Jordan, welcome. Chambersburg, Pennsylvania, Garland, Texas, North Carolina, and of course, Baltimore. Wonderful. Well, welcome everybody. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Welcome to our Friday virtual histories program. We meet, um, my name is Molly Ricks and I'm with Baltimore Heritage. And uh, in 2020, Baltimore Heritage and the Baltimore Architecture Foundation partnered to host these virtual histories every other Friday. So first I wanna thank um, everyone who donated uh, to be with us here today. Your support enables us to continue to do these talks. Um, just a few announcements before we get started. On June 3rd, please join us for our next virtual history talk, and that's going to be on the Olmsted firm's evolving relationship with the Roland Park Company. So join us back here on June 3rd. And now for today's presentation. Dr. Nicholas Fessenden is the historian and treasurer and co-founder of the Baltimore Immigration Museum. He taught history at Friends School from 1972 to 2010 and also taught as an adjunct Towson University, I'm sorry, an adjunct at Towson University, uh, the Maryland Institute of Art and the Community College of Baltimore County. And we are so happy to have him here today. Um, just so you guys know, this is being recorded and it will be available on the Baltimore Architecture Foundation's YouTube site, um, probably by next week. Um, and if you have any questions, and we absolutely encourage questions, if you have any questions, please add them to the chat box um, or the Q&A box, and we will get to those at the end. Okay, and so with that, please uh, take it away, Nick. Okay, I'm trying to get the screen. Ah, here we go. Okay. Okay. Uh, well, uh, thank you very much um, uh, for the introduction uh, to Baltimore Heritage and the Baltimore Architecture Foundation for inviting me. And uh, thank um, all of you for coming. Uh, so we're going to uh, start right in and uh, tell the story of uh, Baltimore's role in the great wave of immigration from 1830 to 1914. And Baltimore was America's third largest uh, port of entry with one and a half million people landing here. So first we'll look at the logistics on why immigrants came here and how they arrived. So the year 1830 marks a watershed between 1790 and 1830, total immigration to the US came to 11,000 annually. But in the 1830s, immigration rose to 60,000 per year and then increased even more after that. So overall, 33 million crossed the ocean from Europe to America between 1830 and 1914, what we call the Great Wave. Before 1860, the largest number of immigrants to the US came from Ireland. Unlike other East Coast cities, the largest group of Baltimore's immigrants came from the German states and Germany was not yet a unified country. The background to this is that uh, Baltimore had developed a vigorous trade with the German city of Bremen and its harbor Bremerhaven and as far back as the 1790s and Baltimore traded cotton from the south and tobacco to Bremen and by 1830 Bremen's merchants found that transporting immigrants was more profitable than merchandise. Before the Civil War, uh, it was the sailing ships that brought, I'm trying to advance this, ah, no, here we go. Uh, before the Civil War, uh, the, um, it was sailing ships that brought immigrants to our shores and it took six to eight weeks 
in crowded and unsanitary conditions. And uh, most of the sailing ships landed at Fells Point. And in this picture, you can see that the immigrants were crowded into a mezzanine, uh, which was between the cargo hold and the deck. And that's where they cooked, ate, tried to sleep. And um, generally crowded conditions, um, affluent passengers could pay more for individual cabins. After the Civil War, a group of ambitious and far-seeing far businessmen laid the groundwork for Baltimore's immigration growth. At this time, ocean travel by steam had become viable. Steamships could cross the ocean in two weeks on a regular schedule. The convenience, speed, and comfort was so great that steamships replaced sailing ships entirely by the 1870s. The directors of the b &O Railroad saw an advantage in linking ship travel with rail travel, and the b &O extended westward to the cities and farmlands of the Midwest. Locust Point had deeper water than the Inner Harbor and could accommodate larger steamships. In 1867, the b &O reached an agreement with the North German Lloyd Company, uh, which had become Bremen's major immigrant carrier. The B&O built an immigration pier uh, at Locust Point. Uh, you can see the building in the background. Um, they, uh, they extended their tracks right up to the pier and the North German Lloyd agreed to send one ship per month with immigrants and that could be extended uh, and increased. And the pier opened in May. 1868. The, um, the, the North German lawyer, sorry, the uh, B&O had through trains, so um, you could just get off the boat and um, get on board a train and go to Pittsburgh or Cincinnati uh, without, without having to stop or change trains. The um, North German Lloyd established ticket offices all over Central and Eastern Europe, so an immigrant could buy a package and travel to Bremerhaven, sail across the Atlantic and debark at Locust Point and board a train for Cincinnati or Pittsburgh. So between 1868 and 1914, 1.2 million people first set foot on American soil at Locust Point, and most had sailed from Bremerhaven on North German Lloyd ships. In the 1860s and 70s, 75% of them had traveled or traveled west. Historians have divided the motivation for immigration between push and pull factors. And push factors included small farmers who did not wish to subdivide their farms as it would undercut their viability. So the eldest son got the land and the other children had to leave. Rural craftsmen could not compete with industrialization and the emergence of a market economy. Bad harvests and the Irish uh, being the, uh, probably the, the most vivid example. Uh, religious and ethnic persecution, Jews in the Russian Empire were an example. Many European states had a military draft, which some men wished to avoid. The poll factors for the US um, was the religious and political uh, uh, religious and political freedom, higher wages, open land to the Midwest, and a chance for a better life and more opportunities in a rapidly growing economy. So our next part is, who were these immigrants? And as noted, the largest group of immigrants to Baltimore in the 19th century came from Germany. The first Germans in Maryland uh, were uh, settled in Frederick County in the 1730s. As Baltimore started to grow in the 1750s, Germans from Pennsylvania, some from Frederick County and some directly come from Germany, came to Baltimore. The first German language church in the city was the Zion Lutheran Church founded in 1755. And the building uh, here dates back to 1807. Um, the, um, and uh, I'd note also that this is the only church in Baltimore where services are still offered in German. So the main surge came during the period 1830 to 1890, when 80% of the immigrants to Baltimore were German. Many traveled to the Midwest after landing here and to what was known as the German Triangle, that's between Cincinnati, St. Louis, and Milwaukee. 
Some remained in Baltimore where they and their children made up 25% of Baltimore's population between 1860 and 1890. Germans brought their culture with them. By 1900, there were 32 German language churches and seven newspapers. The Germans who landed here came largely from rural areas. A survey of 27 ships between 1846 and 1871, which listed the professions, revealed that 52% were farmers, 32% were craftsmen, 9% were unskilled workers, servants, or laborers, 7% were merchants or professionals, such as teachers, clergy, or doctors. Most likely, the farmers continued their journey to the farmlands of the Midwest. Those who stayed in Baltimore were more likely to be a variety of craftsmen, such as bakers, brewers, butchers, carpenters, and masons. Germans dispersed, settled throughout the city. In 1872, Baltimore City began opening bilingual elementary public schools. At their peak, they enrolled 7,000 children. Also, uh, German Catholic parochial schools took in another 3,000. Germans were also famous for forming clubs, notably 14 singing societies and 15 philanthropic societies. America in the late and uh, middle and late 19th century was split along major cultural conflicts. Germans along with Irish and Jews and other immigrants opposed the prohibition of alcohol, a very big issue at that time. They also opposed Sunday laws, which closed taverns and beer gardens on Sundays. German immigration declined in the 1890s and eventually dropped to a quarter of its previous level. German industry was expanding and absorbed many of those who would have emigrated at an earlier time. As German immigration declined, the process of assimilation into American society increased. Enrollment declined in the German English schools and half of the German newspapers closed by 1914. When 19, in 1917, when the US declared war on Germany, uh, there was a movement against all things German and including food and music. And once the war was over, the harassment stopped, but German Americans be, remained reticent to advertise their heritage. And you can see in this cartoon, um, you have this, uh, you have Europe in the background having been destroyed and this monster landing on the American coast. Uh, and, uh, you know, with the spiked helmet, militarism is what you can see on the, uh, on the helmet. Um, this is typical of the propaganda at that time. Now, going to our next group, uh, the Irish, um, this, um, we see that Ireland is composed of two parts. Northern Ireland uh, has a Protestant majority many of whom settled in Scotland in the 1600s and they make up 15 to 20% of the island's population. American historians call them Scots-Irish. Southern Ireland is Catholic, as noted from 1700 to 1860s, the Irish were the largest immigrant groups to America. Of them, uh, in the 1830s, up to the 1830s, the majority was Protestant and then after that, Catholic. By the 1840s, the population of Ireland had reached 8 million. About half of the peasants in Southern Ireland um, depended on potatoes for food and living, and they lived on rented land, working as laborers for landowners. When the potato famine struck, a million Irish died. One and a half million, mostly Catholic, came to the US between 1845 and 1855. And here is a haunting illustration of a um, um, woman, uh, Bridget O'Donnell and her children. The Irish uh, sailed on what were called coffin ships since so many of the passengers died. They came mostly to Boston, Philadelphia, and New York. Some came to Baltimore and one contemporary described them as quote, the most emaciated creatures I've ever seen. The survivors of the trip were sent to a quarantine area in Canton. The Hibernian Society, uh, which was an Irish benevolent society founded earlier, built a shelter for them, provided medical care, raised donations for food and clothing, and established an employment agency for those immigrants uh, who recovered and were able to work. 
eventually they settled in neighborhoods in Baltimore where blue collar work was available, such as near Mount Clare Station, where they worked for the rapidly growing BNL Railroad. The booming American economy provided modest wages that enabled uh, Irish to step up. After years of saving, many Irish uh, bought um, row houses. And so uh, this is a, the uh, Irish uh, Railroad Museum, Railroad Workers Museum. It's actually the second house flying the flag uh, to the right and the um, uh, 10 and a half feet wide. Um, James and Sarah Feely, both famine survivors and their six children, uh, rented uh, this building uh, in the 1860s. And after saving money, they bought it 20 years later. He developed the skills to become a boiler maker for the B&O and his sons worked there as well. Most of the Irish remained blue collar workers, but their children began to move into the middle classes. As of 1871, Baltimore had six Catholic churches where the Irish worship. After the Civil War, Irish continued to emigrate to the United States at a slower, steadier rate. The starving times were over, so the immigrants were in better health the reasons for this continuous immigration was a lack of industry and opportunities in Ireland. Unlike other groups, that is immigrant groups, women made up half of the immigrants instead of having a male majority. And about half of the single Irish women who came to America worked or started off as domestic servants. Also, the Irish rarely returned to their home country. The next group we will consider are Jews. Between 1830 uh, or before 1830, the Jewish presence in the US was small, no more than 6,000 with 125 living in Baltimore. During 1830 to 1860, 200,000 Jews arrived from Germany and Baltimore's Jewish population stood at 7,000 by 1860. This exodus was in part prompted by restrictions on Jews that some German states imposed. And remember that Germany was not unified. Many of the Jewish immigrants started off as peddlers and eventually went into retail trade with their own stores in Baltimore. Moses Hutzler, Simeon Hecht, Julius Gutman, Max Holshield, and Bernard Cohn, all immigrants began businesses which developed into major department stores. Other Jews went into the garment trade and Baltimore became a center, especially for men's clothing. And here we have uh, the um, uh, Lloyd Street Synagogue built in 1845. And uh, it's the third oldest standing synagogue in the US. Um, and um, the architect was Robert Carey Long Jr. who also built um, the Catholic uh, St. Peter the Apostle and the Presbyterian Church, Presbyterian Church at the corner of um, Franklin and Cathedral. Um, in um, the 1860s, the German states began to lift their restrictions on Jews and German Jewish immigration to the US declined. As uh, some Germans achieved prosperity, they moved Northwest to Utah Place. Jews from Eastern Europe began to arrive in the US and in Baltimore. During 1881 and 1924, two million left Russia and Poland. Their rights had been restricted and they suffered from pogroms or mob attacks. Many saw a better future in America. Another 750,000 came from the Austrian Empire and Romania. In contrast to the German Jews, the Eastern European or Russian Jews were less affluent, more traditional in their religious practices, and they spoke Yiddish, uh, partially derived from medieval German. Many of them settled in Old Town where they worked in the sweatshops and factories of clothing manufacturers who were often German Jews or their descendants. 20 synagogues emerged in Old Town by 1914. Gradually, as they achieved some affluence, they moved to Park Heights Corridor in Northwest Baltimore. There were some cultural and class differences between the German Jews and Eastern European Jews, but they did achieve a sort of unity in 1921 when they merged their charitable organizations to form the Associated Jewish Charities. By 1920, the Jewish population reached 65,000 or 9% of Baltimore's inhabitants. Like the Irish, they rarely returned to their home country. 
as immigration from Germany and Ireland declined by the 1890s, their places were taken by new immigrant groups, largely from Central and Eastern Europe, as railroads extended into that region. In addition to the Russian Jews, four groups began to establish identifiable neighborhoods as of um, uh, the 1880s. And um, this map may be a little bit hard to decipher, uh, but um, let me point out that the, the red dots are the, um, are the German language churches. And so they are dispersed throughout the entire city as we, as we noted. The green dots are the Irish uh, churches, Irish Catholic churches, uh, which were essentially where the Irish lived, which were in places where there was plentiful blue collar work. And uh, the blue dots are the synagogues, and you can see that they're concentrated in Old Town or Jonestown, and then also in the northwest of uh, the Utah place. Um, in addition, the shaded uh, areas uh, are uh, certain um, immigrant groups, and that would be uh, the Czechs who were north and east of Hopkins Hospital, was in the northeast, you see Polonia, as it was called, purple, and that is in the neighborhoods of Fells Point, Highland Town, and Canton. Um, the Lithuanians are uh, in West Baltimore, in the area that's uh, largely occupied by the University of Maryland Hospital and Professional Schools. And then Little Italy is, uh, you can see that where that is, uh, just to the west of the Jones Falls, uh, where it still is today. It's the only neighborhood that still has kept its, um, um, you know, characteristics. The, um, so looking at these groups specifically, the Czechs, uh, also called Bohemians, um, uh, as I said, they were north and east of Hopkins Hospital. They were a Slavic people from the Austrian Empire. Most men worked in the garment trade and their population came to 15,000 by 1930. Uh, the Lithuania is a um, uh, is today an independent country, uh, but before 1918, it was part of the Russian Empire, and uh, which had suppressed their language and the Catholic Church. Um, they also were largely in the garment trade. 15,000 people as of 1930. Little Italy. Um, uh, interesting point is that there was no direct steamship connection uh, to Baltimore from the Mediterranean. Uh, so the Italians who came here first landed in Philadelphia or New York before making their way to Baltimore. Many Italians became produce vendors in the nearby central market. Other Italians went into construction, stone carving, barbering, shoemaking to repair. Um, their population came to 25,000 in 1930. And in the 19th century, Poland um, was divided between Austria, Germany, and Russia. The latter two suppressed the Polish language and the Catholic Church. 1.9 million Poles immigrated to the US and settled in the industrial cities uh, and um, in neighborhoods called Polonia. And Baltimore had the seventh largest Polonia, 50,000 people as of 1930. Uh, main, as we said, mainly in um, Highland Town, Canton, and Fowles Point. Many Polish men worked on the docks and in manufacturing. Many women and children worked in the 70 canneries that uh, ringed Baltimore's Harbor. And here you can see, um, you can see the women and children, um, uh, barefoot children working in this cannery. And um, uh, there was a Maryland law which said that um, uh, which was passed in 1906, this is uh, three years later, uh, which banned child labor under the age of 12, uh, but this is uh, not, not being enforced. Um, and um, so uh, also, I mean, you can't see it in the picture, but uh, if a woman had an infant with her, uh, very often they would be put in the packing boxes uh, and could sleep while the women would work. All these immigrant groups, establish local savings and loans. Uh, groups would pool their resources and then extend mortgages to compatriots for modest row houses. There was no red tape. Um, loans uh, were made on the basis of good character. 
Uh, and the percentage of home ownership ran to 75%, the highest percentage of any American city in the first half of the 19th century. All these immigrant groups established their own philanthropic societies and social clubs, often anchored by churches, uh, all of which served uh, to ease the transition from the immigrants to life in America and to take care of those in need. Uh, and here is a picture of the uh, first um, Polish church, St. Stanislaw Kostka. And um, uh, this is in Fells Point. Uh, it has um, now been sold and has been converted to a health club and the steeple at the top has been uh, taken down. Um, towards, as we sort of moving on, the uh, note that towards the end of the 19th century, Congress began to assert control over immigration. Up to 1891, it was the individual states that had control and responsibility to admit immigrants. But in 1891, Congress took over that function with federal inspectors, and they were to include, quote, idiots, lunatics, convicts, and those likely to become a public charge, as well as polygamists. And later, anarchists were added to the list of undesirables. In addition, those with, quote, loathsome and dangerous contagious diseases, unquote, were quarantined or deported. Steamship companies had to pay for returning those rejected, so they screened the immigrants before boarding the ships and coached them how to answer the questionnaires, with the result that in Baltimore, only 1% of the immigrants landing were denied entry. And here um, uh, you can see an inspector checking um, uh, an immigrant for trachoma, contagious eye disease. The outbreak of World War I ended immigration to the United States for four years. In 1917, the immigration pier was destroyed in a fire. German ships resumed travel to Baltimore in 1923, but Congress by then had greatly limited immigration and those who came here usually landed in New York, um, those who got uh, visas, um, and so Baltimore was no longer a port of entry. In the late 19th and early 20th century, there was also a movement against immigration, um, especially from Eastern Europe and Italy, as reflected in this cartoon, which is you know, not politically correct, but here you can see the immigrants. Um, the ship says it's uh, direct from the slums of Europe daily. The immigrants are seen as rats. There's the mafia, criminals, anarchists, and um, here you see Uncle Sam is, is um, standing, um, you know, trying to stand guard. Um, some are getting through. Um, and the figure on the left, uh, that was uh, sort of in memory of President McKinley, who had been assassinated. Uh, it was not an immigrant who killed him, but the son of a uh, son of immigrants. Uh, but it's general immigrants from Eastern Europe were blamed for his assassination. So uh, by the 1920s, the national mood had turned against immigration from Italy and Eastern Europe. The National Origins Quota Act of 1924 cut immigration to one sixth of its level before 1914 and placed a, and placed a quota on each country based on its percentage of the ethnic makeup of the US. This system remained in effect till 1965. The city of Baltimore continued to grow after 1914 as people from the rural and mountain south, both black and white, journal, journeyed to find work in Baltimore's industries. Large numbers came to the city uh, to work in the shipyards and aircraft factories, especially during World War II. In 1965, Congress, with a bipartisan majority, liberalized the immigration laws, scrapping the quota system and allowing people from all countries to apply for entry visas. This had a major impact on our country's demography, and today, 18% of the U.S. population claims Hispanic heritage, and 6% are of Asian heritage. And we'll close with a view of the Baltimore Immigration Museum, and uh, which you are invited to um, visit. Um, and the, um, the story of Baltimore's immigration is not well known. And most of the physical markers have disappeared, but in May 1916, the Baltimore Immigration Museum opened and it was located in Locust Point. Uh, this, um, and it's, it's in the immigrant house in Locust Point. 
Um, the building was uh, built in 1904 by the congregation of the adjacent German Reformed Church and provided temporary housing and services for immigrants. The church still owns the building today and has given the Baltimore Immigration Museum three rooms for display of the story of Baltimore's role in the peopling of America. And our website is immigrationbaltimore.org. And I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Nick. That was wonderful. Um, so we do have a couple questions. First off, um, maybe, uh, Nick, do you want to stop sharing your screen just so we can see? Sure. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. Okay, hold on. Um, uh, here we are, stopping share. Perfect. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, so first question, uh, where were some of the places immigrants would be quarantined once they got to Fells Point? Do these places have a website to search names? Um, I don't think so. Uh, but uh, the first place was uh, Point Lazaretto, which is across uh, the harbor uh, from Port McHenry. Uh, and the word uh, Lazzaretto is Italian for hospital. And um, so that's a place where um, immigrants were quarantined. Um, uh, this is in the earlier time, uh, say up to about 1880. Um, so, and, and it, was, it was really the, the um, uh, it was the captain and also Baltimore health officials who would decide, you know, who would be, uh, who would be quarantined. Um, and the assumption was once, you know, if they recovered, then they were, uh, you know, free to enter the country, uh, you know, to, to go on and, and do whatever they wanted to do. Uh, later, they moved it down to, um, uh, they moved it down to the, um, uh, by the Key Bridge. Um, and that's, um, so, so that quarantine area was placed there. And also there was a, um, there was a house in Locust Point that was designated as a, um, as, as a place where the immigrants who were being detained, they were kept there. And so some of the quarantine people were put there. So that's, that's kind of like uh, the, the long and the short of it. So in the, it was really sort of the 18, yeah, 1880 is when they moved the, quarantine area down to the Key Bridge, and then also they established, uh, you know, a place um, in Locust Point. It, it, was oh. it was actually on top of a saloon, so. That's convenient. Um, <laughs> so, um, what, quickly, what is the address of the Baltimore Immigration Museum? Okay, so it's 1308 Beeson Street. Okay. And that's, that's 21230. Um, you mentioned some groups that largely did not return home, like the Irish. Uh, did Germans return home much, or what groups did return home a lot? Um, so, so the groups that um, most notably returned home were Italians, uh, and it's about uh, a third of the Italians uh, went back to Italy. And so uh, for them, uh, it was more like coming over to earn some money and then going back home. Uh, and um, you know maybe buying some land if they if they did pretty well. Um, so um, uh, Poles, it was about a quarter went back. Um, uh, Germans, I don't have figures, but um, I, again, it was mostly families that came over. So at least in the beginning, so they tended to stay. Uh, it, it was more like single people were the ones that would you know would would go back. Interesting. Okay. Do you know? Uh, do you know any about the amount of African American migration after the Civil War and the Great Migration, of course, to Baltimore? Okay, yeah, so, so so I would I would see uh, sort of two developments. One is from um, uh, from the Civil War to about World War One, the uh, African American uh, migration, which came mostly from rural Maryland or Virginia. Um, was you know gradual it wasn't like large numbers and so actually the um uh, the african-american percentage of baltimore's population remained at 15 percent. i mean that's what it was in 1870 and then in 19 by 1910 it was the same percentage so as the white population of baltimore increased uh, so did the black population but i'd say it's fairly small in numbers but then in the 20s and then during World War II, and then after World War II, then you have uh, much greater black migration into the city. And so the percentage of blacks, you know, rises to almost half by 1970. 
Uh, so, so I would sort of see that as, as two stages. And I think if you think of this, um, the, um, the, it, it was sort of like, uh, as the European immigration was cut off after 1914, that sort of opened the door for uh, mig migration from the South. Uh, and it's blacks and whites who came to work here. Um, they, um, so, so that sort of opened the doors uh, for that migration. Um, so you said during the presentation there was no direct steamship from the Mediterranean to Locust Point in Baltimore. So Correct. is it assumed that no Italians entered through Locust Point? Uh, <laughs> well, I mean, there might have been some, but uh, you don't you don't see. Uh, I mean, when you look at the passenger lists, I haven't I haven't seen any. Um, I mean, the ships uh, essentially the ships went from um, either from Bremen. Um, or from Liverpool or ports in Ireland. So I don't really see, um, you know, uh, it was essentially the Italians would come in through Philadelphia and New York. There might have been a couple ships that took marble uh, for the Washington buildings uh, from Italy. And so there might have been some Italians, you know, who went, they probably landed at Alexandria and then, you know, came up to Baltimore. But this was, this was really very many, uh, you know, it wasn't very many. Wonderful, thank you. And, and sort of uh, talking about uh, looking at the, the immigration lists and that sort of thing, um, do, does the Immigration Museum have records of immigrants arriving from Europe or where do you find those? Uh, okay, well, there, there are websites, uh, and uh, there's this Immigrant Ships Transcribers Guild, uh, which has, uh, which is transcription of, of the passenger lists, because the, the actual ones are written in cursive and are hard to read, uh, but, um, so that's istg.org, um, so that's, I, I'm, we don't have any records in our museum, uh, but one of our workers has a database of 140,000 names of people who have uh, come through Locust Point. So, um, you know, so again, he, he would be very happy to, you know, to assist anyone who's you know, sort of looking for names. That's great. That's wonderful. Um, here's a question. It is really interesting the SNL and home ownership numbers you mentioned that it was the highest in the nation. Do you have any insight on why Baltimore was at the top? Um, well, it's not, um, I guess when you compare it with New York, um, New York is much more densely settled and you had these tenement houses, these you know, five foot, five story buildings. And, and so simply like, you know, individual, you know, home ownership would be much harder in a in a sort of densely settled city like that. Um, so Baltimore had a little bit more space, and um, and I think the uh, the immigrants really worked very hard to establish home ownership. And um, so uh, and and I think uh, yeah, just I, I would say that was that would basically it. Is that the the logistics? You know, the fact that you did have the space for these row houses, um, I think, made it made it possible. Uh, but, but yeah, I mean, the immigrants worked very hard to, to um, uh, you know, to establish these, these SNLs and then, you know, to, you know, and it was like a major, I mean, that was sort of one's existence. The worst thing you could do would be to default on your, on your mortgage. So, uh, so that's, that's, um, uh, you know, how that worked out. Wonderful. And, and this is a bit of a personal question, so feel free to not answer it, but Given your interest and knowledge of local immigration, have you traced your family as immigrating through Baltimore? Uh, well, actually, uh, they um, um, it actually has been done um, by family members before me, so I didn't have to do anything. But yeah, um, so uh, my ancestors came uh, in the uh, late uh, 1600s uh, into New England, so they were they were English, and um, so that was. You know, at least that's the, the Fessenden family. Yeah. Wonderful, thank you. And um, maybe this will be our last question. We've had a couple of questions about Greek immigrants. Could you speak to Greek immigration briefly? Uh, yes, um, the, um, the Greeks tended to come uh, sort of at the very end. And um, there, there is Greek town, which is, um, you know, uh, Greek stores and restaurants on Eastern Avenue. Um, although I think the Greeks tended to uh, live you know, in a variety of places throughout the cities. I mean, 
it's, um, you know, it's sort of debatable whether you can say, you know, you had the same density of Greek population as you had, say, Italians in Little Italy. Uh, but yeah, so so there is this enclave in um, an Eastern Avenue. But of course, the main Greek church is in Mount Vernon, um, and um, the um, the Greek cathedral is in Mount Vernon, so Preston Street. So it's, um, you know, they certainly were, there certainly is a Greek presence in the city, uh, although I'm not sure it was, you have quite the density of, um, you know, settlement that you had with the other, some of the other immigrant groups. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Nick, for coming out. Um, just a reminder to everyone that this program is uh, recorded and will be available on the Baltimore Architecture Foundation's YouTube page by next week. All right, thanks. Okay, thank you. Thank you, everyone.